So hi, my name is Jessica. Um, I will be presenting with uh, Luchaska. We're both Stanford students and we are a member of the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, a national nonprofit also called ALSI for short. And today we'll be giving a presentation on lung cancer and the importance of lung cancer screenings. And we're so grateful to present to you guys today. Yes, so before we get started, uh, we would just like to request that everyone is muted during the presentation. However, we would love to take any questions that you may have at the end of our presentation. Um, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat box for us to look at and address later on. All right, um, so before I get into the content of the presentation, I'd like to share a little bit about the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative and what it does. Um, ALSI is a 501c nonprofit organization that works to raise awareness for lung cancer and lung cancer screening. We're a team of over 200 passionate students and doctors located across the United States, and we work with community organizations like the South Asian Network and American Indian Cancer Foundation, as well as city and state health departments, including the New York City and Connecticut Health Departments. So we hope that in educating communities about lung cancer and lung cancer screenings, high-risk community members will be encouraged to seek out these um, really important lung cancer screenings. Today, we'll discuss both lung cancer as well as these screenings, and we'll address questions such as how common lung cancer is, what is screening, what does it entail, and how you can get screened if you're eligible. Yes. So first, we'll talk about some important statistics around lung cancer. Yeah, lung cancer is a very common. It is actually the second most common um, cancer in the United States, excluding uh, skin cancer. And this graph shows the American Cancer Society estimates for the number of new cancer cases in the United States. And the graph estimates that new cancer cases, um, that cancer cases in 2022 uh, for the four most common um, cancers. And as you can see, it's estimated that, um, it was estimated that for lung cancer, 236,740 people would have been diagnosed with lung cancer in that year. Um, and to put this number in perspective, so it is estimated that about 6% of people will develop lung cancer during their lifetime in the United States. That means about uh, roughly one in every 15 men and one in every 17 women will be diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, moreover, not only is lung cancer very common, it is also very fatal. Uh, lung cancer is, in fact, the leading cause of cancer-related death in the U.S. and around the world. In um, 2022, it was also estimated that lung cancer would uh, screenings would save uh, claim would save lives, but also that lung cancer would claim the lives of around 130,180 people. And this graph shows the American Cancer Society estimates for the number of cancer-related deaths in the United States. As you can see, lung cancer is by far the most of, more fatal than breast, prostate, and colon cancer, call, causing more deaths than all of those combined. And lung cancer makes up almost 25% of all cancer deaths in the world, um, and it results in about 350 deaths per day. Every year, there are about 50,000 new cases of breast cancer, but lung cancer causes over 90,000 more deaths. Um, so from this data, the question that arises is why lung cancer mortality is so high. And well, lung cancer mortality is so high because patients are typically diagnosed at a later stage in their um, trajectory of the illness. Yes, so stage is a way for doctors to classify a cancerous tumor based on the tumor size, if the cancer has spread to what are called lymph nodes, and if the cancer has spread to any other locations in the patient's body. Uh, so you may ask, uh, why is stage important? It's important because the stage that lung cancer is diagnosed at correlates directly with survival. When lung cancer is diagnosed at a later stage, the five-year survival rate is only about 6.7%, and we'll discuss this more in the next slide. Ugh. 
One way that doctors track the survival of patients is by looking at their five-year survival. And the five-year survival for patients with localized lung cancer is 57%, but only 25% of lung cancers are diagnosed at this stage. In comparison, nearly half of all lung cancers are diagnosed at a very distant stage. And this is why early detection is so important. If we can detect lung cancer at an early stage, then treatment options are better and prognosis is much better as well. With lung cancer being such a morbid disease, some of you might be wondering why the majority of lung cancers are diagnosed at such a late stage to begin with. Well, the majority of patients are diagnosed with late stage lung cancer because they usually don't start feeling any of the symptoms of lung cancer until the cancer has grown and spread. The most common symptom of lung cancer are chronic cough, coughing of blood, chest pain, and shortness of breath. And additional symptoms might include hoarseness, loss of appetite, fatigue, persistent lower respiratory infections, and a new onset of wheezing. However, when people become symptomatic, the cancer has grown and spread to a point where it's much more difficult to treat and the prognosis is poor. If the diagnosis of lung cancer has to wait until the patient has symptoms, it's difficult to catch the lung cancer early. So the question we ask is, how do we catch lung cancer early if patients are asymptomatic? So one of the best ways we can do this is through lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening is done using something called the low dose computed tomography, tomo sorry, it's a kind of a tongue twister, tomography scan. If you are eligible for lung cancer screening, it is recommended that you get an annual lung cancer screening. And in the coming slides, we will discuss what lung cancer screening is, who should get screened and how one can get screened. So an important distinction we want to make is that lung cancer screening is done using low-dose computed tom tomography, also known as a low-dose CT scan, and not the chest x-ray. Uh, we use low-dose CT scan because it provides more detailed pictures than chest x-rays and is better at finding small abnormal areas in the lungs. The picture on the left is a picture of a chest x-ray. The yellow arrows point to the abnormal area, but it's, as you can see, very unclear. On the other hand, the image on the right is a picture of a low-dose CT scan of the chest. The red arrows, um, and I can, yeah. And then, so you can see here that we have much more detailed image on where the abnormal areas are. Uh, with much greater detail. So the question that researchers want to answer is how effective um, the low-dose CT scan is at detecting lung cancers at this early stage. Um, an important lung cancer screening trial called the National Lung Cancer Trial, or the NLST, tried to answer this question, and we'll discuss the results of that. So the NLST was a large national study that involved over 50,000 patients and the goal of the study was to determine the effectiveness of using a low-dose CT scan to detect lung cancer in patients who were considered high risk for lung cancer. So the study included two groups, the first group being a group of patients who received annual low-dose CT scans, and the second group being a group of patients who received just an annual chest x-ray. And by comparing the stages at which cancers were caught between these two groups, the study wanted to determine if the low-dose CT scan was better at catching more lung cancers at an early stage. And as you can see, of everyone who was diagnosed with lung cancer, the low-dose CT scan actually caught the most amount of lung cancers at an early stage while the x-ray diagnosed more patients at stage four, so already the distant stage where treatment is much worse. Um, and so this has important implications for survival because the low CT scan caught more lung cancers at an earlier stage. These cancers were more likely to be treatable and the prognosis was of course much better. This translates to a 20% reduction in mortality um, for those who underwent lung cancer screening using that low-dose CT scan compared to, to an X-ray. So one main concern with any screening test is accuracy. Essentially, how good is, for example, in this case, the low-dose CT scan at catching lung cancer? 
Well, for every 100 individuals undergoing CT lung screening, 25 will be positive, while 75 will be negative. Of those 75 that are negative, 97.7 to about 100% truly do not have lung cancer. This means that the test is very good at identifying people who do not have lung cancer. That is, if you do have lung cancer, the test will most likely come back positive and the test will not in fact miss your cancer. Out of the 25 individuals who are positive for lung cancer, 23 turn out to be negative for cancer, primarily with follow-up imaging alone. This means that even if your test result is a false positive, it's very, really easy to rule out cancer using further non-invasive imaging. The two individuals that have a positive test result out of this uh, 25 and truly do have lung cancer are more likely to be diagnosed at an early stage than if they were not to undergo the lung cancer screening. This means that their treatment options and prognosis can both be much better. The results of the NLST study were published in 2011, which is rough, roughly 11 years ago, and several studies have been published since then, which further confirm this life-saving benefit of lung cancer screening in high-risk populations. And one of the most important ones is what we call uh, the Nelson trial. So in February of 2020, the results of the Nelson trial were published. Like the NLST, the Nelson trial had two groups. However, unlike the NLST, the Nelson had a group that received low-dose CT scans and a group that received no screening of any kind. A total of 13,195 men and 2,594 women between the ages of 50 and 74 were randomly assigned to undergo CT screening to a baseline one year, three year, and a five year or no screening. And the results confirmed that life-saving benefit of lung cancer screening by low dose CT scan was in fact valid. In the screening group, 58% of lung cancers were diagnosed at stage one. In the non-screening group, 13% of lung cancers were diagnosed at stage one. So early detection does indeed translate into a reduction in mortality. In the low-dose CT group, there was a 24% reduction in lung cancer mortality in men and 33% reduction in lung cancer mortality in women when compared to no screening. The Nelson trial also showed that with improvements in low-dose CT technology, the false positive rate was reduced significantly. So lung cancer overall, um... Lung cancer screening overall significantly reduces lung cancer mortality. But uh, the question is, who should get screened for lung cancer? So the United States Preventative Service Task Force, also known as the USPSCF, sets guidelines for who should be screened for lung cancer. And right now, they recommend that people between the ages of 50 to 80 who have uh, at least a 20-year pack year smoking history or greater and who are current or former smokers who have quit within the past 15 years, they should get be ones to get an annual low-dose CT scan for lung cancer screening. Yes, so the current screening guidelines right now require you to have a 20-pack year smoking history. Now, pack year is probably a term that most people have not heard before, but it is just a way for doctors to track uh, one's smoking history over a period of time. So a pack year is defined as smoking a pack of cigarettes per day for a year. So for example, if you were to smoke one pack a day for 20 years, that would equate to a 20 pack year smoking history. Alternatively, if you were to smoke two packs a day for 10 years, that would also equate to a 20 pack year smoking history. So the important takeaway here is that there are many different ways to reach 20 pack years and the pack year is a way to help doctors track one smoking history. Here is another way to track smoking history by counting the number of cigarettes smoked per day rather than packs of cigarettes. So on average, each pack of cigarettes has about 20 cigarettes. So we can take the number of cigarettes smoked per day, divide by 20, and multiply by the year smoked to calculate the pack year smoking history as well. So now there have been um, some changes and some new guidelines, and these new guidelines were nearly double the number of eligible individuals 
for lung cancer screening in the United States. Notably, the most apparent increases in eligibility will occur among women and minority populations. However, while these new guidelines will include more high-risk individuals, they only include individuals with heavy smoking histories. There are other risk factors for lung cancer that are not accounted for in these current screening guidelines. After smoking, the leading cause of lung cancer is exposure to radon gas, which is released from soil and can build up indoors. Moreover, secondhand smoking causes almost 3% of new diagnosis of lung cancer and is expected to cause about 3% of deaths from it. Additional risk factors include exposure <coughs> to family has lung cancer, COPD, and previous radiation therapy to the lungs. It's also important to recognize that these additional risk factors, because, um, and we recognize these because although lung cancer has a strong association with smoking, there are a large number of people in the United States who have never had, who have never smoked or had a smoking history that still do get lung cancer. Approximately 20% of individuals who are diagnosed with lung cancer actually have never had a smoking history prior. So lung cancers can in fact also occur in what we call never smokers, who are individuals who have smoked less than 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. Because lung cancer has such a strong association with smoking, people are often surprised to learn that lung cancer and never smokers account for about 10 to 20% of, of lung cancer diagnoses and is the eighth leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States and the world. N moreover, never smoke, um, more never smokers die from lung cancer each year than people who die from ovarian cancer. And this graph shows a proportion of lung cancer cases that occur in individuals who have smoked in their life and people who have never smoked. It is then further broken down by whether they are current, former, or never smokers, as, um, as you can see, uh, there are 80 to 90% of lung cancers that occur in people who have smoked during their lifetime, and about 10 to 20% occur in individuals classified as never smokers. Right now, lung cancer screening is not recommended for individuals who have never smoked. However, understanding lung cancer in never smokers is a current focus of research. With the development of new screening technologies and risk models, there may be a way to identify high-risk never smokers who should be screened for lung cancer. So interestingly, women are more likely to be never smokers when they are diagnosed with lung cancer. In fact, in the U.S., 60 to 70 percent of never smokers diagnosed with lung cancer are in fact women. So in summary, in summary lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death in the U.S., and it is so deadly because most lung cancers are diagnosed at a late stage when they have spread to other locations in the body already. Importantly, early detection through lung cancer screening by the use of low dose CT can reduce lung cancer mortality by up to 33%. This graph shows the national screening rates for some of the most common cancers, including breast, cervical, and colon cancers. The screening rates for these are cancers for average around 73%. So what now we can ask, how do you guys think the lung cancer screening um, percentage would be? And if we take a look at that, the lung cancer screening rate is just 5.7%. So all these four cancers have screening tests that are recommended by the United States Preventative Task for Service Force. But the uptake of lung cancer screening is much lower than the uptake of screening for other cancers. And so the American Lung Cancer Association estimates that if we were to screen every high-risk individual recommended by the United States Preventative Task Force in the U.S., we would save around 48,000 lives. However, if we only screen 5.7, as we are doing so now, um, that means a lot of lives that can, can, could be saved are not being saved. And in the state of California, less than 1% of individuals are getting screened, which is the by far the worst uh, screen um, any state in, in the cost of nation has. And so we can also ask the question why that might be. 
So the lung cancer screening rate is low for a number of reasons, including limited awareness and concerns regarding access to screening, the cost of the screening itself, and the safety of the screening. In the next slides, we will be discussing each of these topics, but the important takeaway though is that lung cancer screening can in fact help reduce an individual's risk of dying from lung cancer. The first potential concern we will address is the cost of lung cancer screenings. The average low-dose CT scan costs anywhere from $300 to $400, but most insurance companies, including Medicare and Medicaid, will cover the cost for eligible patients. However, there are a few exceptions. Medicare will only cover lung cancer screenings until the age of 77. Not all Medicaid plans cover lung cancer screening, and patients will still pay the usual fees for provider appointments before or after the scan. So as Jessica just mentioned, unfortunately, not all state Medicaid plans cover lung cancer screening. And here you can see a map updated in July 2022 showing which state Medicaid plans do and do not cover lung cancer screening. So dark purple states have state Medicaid plans that do cover lung cancer screening and use updated guidelines. Meanwhile, the light purple states also have state Medicaid plans that cover lung cancer screening, but may be using older lung cancer screening guidelines. And in the blue states, uh, those states are not uh, where they are not covered, which include Arkansas, Alabama, and Alaska. And in gray states, such as Hawaii, this particular information uh, may not yet be available. So the first step to getting a patient screened for lung cancer is having them talk to their primary care provider. There are certain questions a primary care provider has to ask and topics that has, have to be discussed. One of these is the patient's pack year smoking history, which we saw how to calculate in earlier slides. So to find accredited lung cancer screening centers, patients can go to the website of the American College of Radiology, which you can access by either scanning this QR code right here on the screen or going to this link that we have typed out here. Uh, from there, you can type in the state or city that you live in to see where accredited lung cancer screening facilities are located near you. The American College of Radiology website is right here once again. As far as how the experience of getting a low-dose CT scan goes, it will require you to lay on your back for about five minutes and you'll be doing something very similar to the patient um, in the photo here. Um, one thing to note is that, there, that this process will not hurt at all. And because it's a low dose CT scan, you do not use contrast. This means that there will be no, no need for any needles or injections involved. The low CT scan is also non-invasive, it's fast and completely pain-free. Additionally, the amount of radiation exposure is very, very low. So the way that doctors measure the amount of radiation a patient may receive is through a unit called the millisievert. It is just a way to measure radiation and compare the levels of radiation received during different activities and over time. So for a low dose CT scan, you will be exposed to 1.5 to 2 millisieverts of radiation. This is a lot lower than a full chest CT scan which requires a radiation dose of eight millisieverts. To put that in perspective, you are exposed to 3.11 millisieverts of radiation a year, just from breathing, cosmic radiation, eating, and the radiation that naturally comes from the earth. So a low dose CT scan exposes you to less radiation than you are already exposed to from just a kind of living and walking around on earth every day which means that the level of radiation you receive from an annual lung, ca lung cancer screening test is very, very small. That being said, this is always something that patients can discuss with their own primary care provider. So a patient, let's say a patient talked with their primary care doctor and the, the primary care doctor uh, referred the patient to a screening center and they received the low dose CT scan. So what is next? The doctor will receive the results of this patient's screening test and will follow up with the patient to go over the results. 
As far as results go, there are most three most likely outcomes. The first outcome is that the scans are normal. If this is the case, then the patient should um, look to get repeated scans in a year, and um, then we'll get the results and see if everything is okay. The second option might be that the scan is abnormal, but probably benign. Um, then the patient should talk to their doctor about the next steps, and this can include obtaining more scans, some additional tests, or some biopsies to assess the abnormal abnormality that was found in the screening test. And the third option might be that um, the scans are abnormal and they look slightly suspicious. So in that case, the patient will most likely have to undergo an additional screening test, such as a biopsy, to um, look and see whether the tumor is benign or if it is malignant, and then next steps will be done after that. So as we mentioned earlier, while smoking is a risk factor for lung cancer, there are several other risk factors as well. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the general population and the leading cause of lung cancer in individuals who do not smoke. Radon is responsible for about 21,000 lung cancer deaths every year. And once again, radon is a radioactive gas released from the normal decay of the elements uranium, thorium, and radium that can be found in rocks and soil. Without special equipment, it is very difficult to detect because it is an invisible, orderless, tasteless gas that can seep up through the ground and diffuse into the air we breathe. Radon is present in nearly all air, but only at very low levels. Only about 0.4 uh, picocuries per liter of radon is normally found in the outside air that we breathe every day. It is when radon levels are very, very high that individuals are at risk of developing lung cancer. So one may ask, how does this happen? Well, radon can enter homes and collect indoors. It can also be released from building materials or from water that is obtained from wells that contain the radon. Radon levels can be higher in homes that are well insulated, tightly sealed, or built on soil that is rich in the elements uranium, thorium, and radium. Radon decays quickly, giving off these tiny radioactive particles, and when inhaled, these radioactive particles can damage the cells that line our lungs. Uh, therefore, long-term exposure to radon can lead to lung cancer, and the only cancer proven to be associated uh, with inhaling radon is lung cancer. Uh, and just to, to kind of mention, Radon can also impact pets, as high levels of radon may damage uh, pets' respiratory systems and also put them at risk for cancer. And some of the areas in the U.S. that have higher radon levels uh, are Alaska and South Dakota. So uh, both of these states are kind of the top states that have the highest radon levels that have been measured. Uh, however, it is crucial to remember that radon can be an issue in any home and anywhere. Here is a map of radon zones from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Zone 1 indicates regions with radon levels greater than 4 picocuries per liter. Zone 2 indicates radon levels from 2 to 4 picocuries per liter. And Zone 3 indicates radon levels less than 2 picocuries per liter. However, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, recommends that all homes get tested for radon regardless of location just to make sure that the levels are um, below that baseline. So the only way to truly know the radon levels of one's individual home is by testing. So testing is pretty easy and low cost. And to test your home, you can pick up an at-home testing kit from a home improvement store or hire a radon measurement specialist. You can also get this affordable kit from the hardware store or by calling 1-800-SOS-RADON, uh, which is 1-800-767-7236, or by going to the National Radon Program Services website, uh, sosradon.org slash test dot, oh, sorry, dash kits. The average cost for a test kit is between about $1030, and um, the EPA has set the action level for radon at four picocuries per liter. If the results from the test that you administer 
are for pico curies per liter or higher uh, that can uh, really, like, that's needed, uh, action is needed uh, in that situation. Um, and what, uh, additionally, you can also contact your state radon office to get the name of a local expert who can give advice and you can basically uh, fix some of the radon problems uh, that you may find in your home with simple, low, or no cost solutions. But for bigger radon problems, you do need a specialist called a mitigation contractor to come in and fix uh, whatever may be wrong or malfunctioning in your home. Another question we get often is how vaping and e-cigarette use affects lung cancer risk. They I think Jessica. Oh, uh, yeah. I am so sorry. I think um, her internet connection may have cut out. Okay. She's um, okay. Sorry about that. My internet has been a little unstable today. I think it kicked me off, but let me try to share my screen once more. Okay. All right. Um, so the e-cigarette devices and vaping fluids can contain nicotine derivatives and heavy metals, among other chemicals. And these arise both as elements of the e-liquid as well as the organic reactions that take place in the um, electronic cigarette device. And various uh, studies demonstrate in vitro transforming and cytotoxic activities of these uh, derivatives. Vaping causes fewer health risks than smoking, but it's not a risk-free activity by any means. Vaping, vaping can increase heart rate, decrease air volume in the lungs, and increase airway resistance. Furthermore, e-cigarette use has been significantly increasing, particularly amongst young adults and non-smokers, making it an area of significant concern for the future. So... Uh, while lung cancer screening uh, does have the potential to save many lives, it is also very important to address smoking cessation. Uh, in other words, uh, stopping smoking in the context of lung cancer screening. So as this presentation comes to conclusion, we want to end on what we, the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, are doing to begin the widespread awareness, education, and advocacy efforts necessary to increase the lung cancer screening rate. Lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the world, and while lung cancer screening can save so many lives, very few high-risk individuals are actually getting screened for lung cancer. We are working to address all aspects of the issue. Last fall, I'll also work with the US Congress members and senators to draft and pass a um, proclamation. And this was the first ever House and Senate resolution recognizing the importance of the early detection of lung cancer through screening. In December of 2020, the Senate resolution was passed with unanimous consent marking the first time the U.S. Senate has ever recognized the importance of lung cancer screening. ALSI also has been very active, we working with Representative Brendan Boyle and Senator Tina Smith to draft and advocate for Catherine's Law for Lung Cancer Early Detection and Survival Act. Additionally, we have given webinars such as this one to educate a variety of audiences about lung cancer all across the U.S. Um, and these screenings um, are also talked about in these presentations, but they are conduced, conducted by students, community members, healthcare providers, community leaders, and policymakers. And just in general, we're just trying to spread the word um, about this important topic. 
We believe that educating communities, especially students, about lung cancer and lung cancer screening is crucial to lowering the number of deaths associated with this disease. And students greatly impact and influence the health care of their parents. And we hope that by educating students as well um, about these important measures that can be taken, we will not only be able to help students in the future, but also their family members. Yes, so once again, this slide kind of shows um, the things that we have been working on and the things that we are continuing to work on as we go into the future. Mm -hmm. so and if, if you know you anyone... Know... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> if you know anyone who might be eligible for lung cancer screening based on the criteria uh, that we uh, mentioned and talked about throughout this webinar, please feel free to share the link given by this QR code so that they can contact one of our doctors about lung cancer screening. And so we, um, this concludes our presentations and we're more than happy to take any questions that you guys might have about um, anything lung cancer, lung cancer screening. And if you do see, think that you would benefit from having a lung cancer screening test done, our Stanford chapter does have a partnership with the Stanford Screening Clinic that goes ahead and provides free lung cancer screenings to anyone who fits the eligibility criterion. So between the ages of 50 to 80, having at least 20 pack years and a current or former smoker. If um, you know you or anyone you know um, fits these criteria and would be interested, we're also more than happy to distribute those resources so that you can get in contact with the screening clinic and they can conduct that screening for you cost-free. But um, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and I, we are happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your time and attention. There are a couple of uh, comments on the chat. Okay, I see a question on chronic cough. Um, yeah, so the symptoms are very broad. They're not very specific to having shallow or deep or having any sort of like, um, any sort of like phlegm or anything of the sort, but just having that cough always might be an indicator. Um, however, I do wanna point out that um, multiple symptoms might need to be necessary. Um, so it's always just important to talk to, to this about, um, about this to your primary care provider so that they can sort of um, understand and see if there are any um, other possibilities for this that aren't lung cancer. And I see another question on um, what is the basis for the age 77? Um, yeah, so right now the, that the screening guidelines for Medicare are not very expansive at all and do limit the amount of people that are able to get lung cancer screenings. Um, so we know that, you know, younger, younger adults also get lung cancer. Um, there's actually been an increase in younger adults, like 30 and up that are getting it. And so um, this has been an area of active like expansion. And that's something that our organization is, is really working on doing to expand the amount of people that can get screened, um, because we do see that these guidelines are very restricted. Um, and it just purely, it really is about like advocating and like getting this into our like healthcare system and making sure that our political leaders are also putting this on their political agenda to push the, this forward and get more funding for, for these things. Um, and I also see another one in, um, that is concerning the guidelines and the eligibility criterions. Um, so, yeah, I um, and I had smoking sixteen fifty two. Yeah, I think that perhaps that it would be helpful um if I can distribute that information for you to get um that in contact with the screening center so that they might be able to provide you with um the lung cancer screening test and just make sure that everything is okay. Um, yeah, I mean that the eligibilities are just sort of like a baseline that we want to have like everyone who falls into that um, get screened just in case and, and make sure that they get these annual screenings so that we're able to catch anything early if there is anything to be concerned of. Um, but I will definitely be um, sending out that, um, that pamphlet as well as the contact information for the Stanford Screening Center. 
Um, and they will also go ahead and conduct that screening eligibility exam once more to make sure that this is something that um, is relevant to you. And then they'll proceed from there. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much, Jessica and Renzesca. What a very informative presentation. Yeah, so thank you so much for having us. And then would I be able to send you- um, Yes, if the... you can send it to me, I'll forward to the registration. Great. Perfect, alrighty. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and um, yeah, have a wonderful day. You too, take care, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.